Um, again, my name is Charmaine Chua. I am an assistant professor at Overland College, and I teach political science there. And so the perspective I'm coming from is really about thinking about the political, economic, and political social dimensions um, of shipping infrastructure. My own research is about the rise of just-in-time logistics and the ways it's produced sort of uneven effects on vulnerable populations. Um, so... I think what I want to try to do today is to, to get us to think about how shipping is not just about 2.2% of carbon emissions, because I think that does sound a little bit small, but once we actually zoom out to think about the broader conditions in which shipping came to be so consequential to the global economy, we think, I think what I'm hoping to change our minds about is that there's actually a lot more going on there and that the conditions of possibility for what we now know today as logistics and capitalism are actually sort of fundamentally enabled by the shipping sector. So that's a little bit of um, what I'm going to cover today. So let's start with what we do know, um, and this probably repeats some of the information. So a single container ship generates fuel emissions equal to that of 50 million cars. Um, and so of the 760 million cars that are currently operating worldwide, um, they emit as much as sulfur as 15 container ships running at full capacity. Um, and so if you extend that to the total global feed of, of 5,000 container ships, that's a massive amount of fuel that's being generated. Um, and I think Brian also uh, covered the fact that high, heavy fuel oil, when burned, also produces black carbon, um, which, which rains down and has been responsible for acid rain and especially sort of uh, exacerbated effects on coastal regions. So all told, that's 1,000... Is 1,000 million a billion? Yeah, no. I think that's supposed to say 100 million tons of CO2 annually, sorry. Um, so also that's, a, that's, I think, Brian, do you know this? It's a billion tons. Okay. I am not a proper scientist, clearly. Um, and that's 2.3 to 2.5 of global carbon emissions totally. Um, the IMO uh, projects that it could be responsible for 17% of global CO2 emissions in 2050 if left unregulated. If, if left unregulated. And if you counted that as a country, um, the, the total global shipping industry would be the sixth largest source of CO2, equivalent to about that of Germany, more than the UK, Canada, or Brazil. Now, whenever I say the statistic, people sort of, that's when it hits, right, that if you counted it as a country, it's really pretty significant. Um, but I actually want to suggest that counting it as a country is precisely what misses the point. Um, so on the one hand, we want an analogy that sticks, right, that makes sense to us. But on the other, I think the shipping industry is unique precisely because it's not like a country, precisely because it isn't regulated in the, in the same way, um, and precisely because federal regulations can't really get at it. And so there are three aspects, I think, of what I want to talk about today that are going to sort of tackle that question. So we know that over 80% of the world of total world trade travels over the ocean. Um, and, you know, so Noel, uh, two filmmakers called by the name of Noel Birch and Alan Sakula have called the ocean the forgotten space, right? It's this area that's sort of walled off from our imaginations. We don't see them very often. And in fact, as ports have developed further and further away from cities, they sort of uh, are not part of the built environment that we interface with regularly. Um, but in fact, they are so consequential to literally everything that we consume, eat, buy. Um, and in fact, what shipping has done is actually enable the kind of just-in-time logistics, um, you know, expectation that we get deliveries as soon as we click on a button. So I'm going to cover three aspects of that forgotten space that we should strive to think about. Um, the first is the legal and international dimensions, which I'll move through pretty quickly because I think that's been covered. Um, the second is the question of its technical design and the way in which intermodal infrastructure actually produces effects on land that are pretty consequential. Um, and the third is to think about container shipping as a site of politics and to shift the way that we're thinking about climate change, not just as climate mitigation or adaptation, but that we necessarily have to interrogate the capitalist conditions that have produced shipping as such, um, and that, you know, if that is the case, then we might want to think about climate change as a terrain of social struggle and not just a technological one. Okay, so the legal dimensions, as has been mentioned, is that no single country is responsible for climate mitigation when it comes to the shipping sector. Um, it's a polycentric form of governance, and so what that means is that under international maritime law, there aren't really clear ways in which uh, shipping emission reductions can be regulated or states can be held accountable. Um, the murky jurisdiction of that law 
sometimes and often means that the states are the ones that are held accountable. But if you remember Brian's graph from previously where so many pieces of the pie are held by tiny countries, part of what happens is that a lot of states flag out uh, in what are called, what the ITF calls flags of convenience, which essentially allows them to skirt um, regulations that otherwise, you know, more so to speak, regulated countries would hold them accountable to. And what that necessarily means is that the state-based enforcement mechanisms on which international maritime law apply don't actually apply in a space where the murky jurisdiction allows you to shift back and forth between different countries um, in relatively convenient ways. So all it takes, for example, to have a flagged ship under the state of Moldova is um, to have a country, to have an office in the country, or even just a mailing address. Um, and Moldova, in particular, as a flag state or a known flag of convenience um, nation, for example, only had 80, had 88 detentions out of 590 flagged ships um, in the last year. So that's significant, right? These are 88 ships that don't conform to the kinds of laws that, um, under the International Maritime Organization, climate change um, perspectives are, are sort of held accountable to. Um, and we can talk more about that later. But the second, and this is what I sort of want to talk about a little bit more, is the, how the technical design of intermodalism sort of um, constrains or changes the calculus of how much shipping is responsible for. So how many of you have bought something online in the last two weeks? Yeah, and how many of you did it because it was just faster than going to the shop down the road? So it's crazy how our consumption patterns have changed, right? And really, I think um, this is arguable, but, but this is, has only really happened since the 1970s. And in fact, the two-day delivery expectation really only started in 2002 when Amazon started Prime membership. And that has sort of started a whole sort of ensuing, um, you know, effort to compete with Amazon. So I want you to imagine, oh, that did not work. Okay, I'm just going to pause this. So this is a this is a depiction of the global container shipping fleet, um, and the yellow dots are container ships. But this map is produced by um, an organization. Well, the website shipback.org, and I highly recommend it. It's great if you click around. You can see the dry belt carriers. You can see it by ship types and how much um, this stuff is generated. So they do amazing work. Um, but sorry, I just want want you to picture for a second what it means to have bought the let's say the speakers that you purchased online this week, right? Um, the everyday normalcy with which we expect something to arrive at our doorstep has actually taken a whole host of recalibrations and reorganizations of economic space. Um, so the, the container travels across, is produced in China, let's say, travels across the Pacific, and what might be startling to those of you who live in New York is that even though you have a big port of New York here, 40% of all goods that are consumed in the U.S. Are, arrive at the port of L.A. And that's because the Trans-Pacific journey between China and the U.S. makes much more sense without having to travel under the Panama Canal. And a lot of policy that has happened since then has actually aided land bridge transportation or the ability for you to move those products from the port of L.A. to New York. So there's a surprising way in which it's not just shipping that that is sort of at stake here, right, but the intermodal infrastructure. Okay, so speakers arrive at a port where over 800 trucks pick up and drop off um, containers every hour, and these are single can trucks, so they, they are sort of relatively um, not super efficient. Um, and then, you know, your uh, product arrives at your doorstep by the friendly UPS guy. Okay, so what, has ta what it has taken for that to happen is a whole host of really complicated recalibrations, which you know, scholars are calling logistics today. And what logistics tries to think about is the optimization of each, each point so that whereas you used to think about production sites, transportation sites, and distribution and consumption sites as relatively different, today those are sort of all optimized within a single circuit. So that what logistics managers think about is how to optimize the entirety of the global system as a, as a field, which they can think about at, in terms of efficiency calculations. And so what you get is essentially is, you know, the ability, what shipping allowed was the ability for you to produce your goods in China and ship them relatively at low cost across the ocean. Prior to the shipping container, um, longshore workers would have to handle things like bananas by the single bunch. And what the container essentially did was it wasn't just a form that boxed up goods, but it also 
one, it, it prevented weather damage. It allowed you to refrigerate the contents, therefore extending the life of the products that go within it. So for example, uh, if you eat tilapia, or if you eat any kind of fish, sometimes they're caught in Alaska, shipped over to China on ice to be filleted, and then shipped back to you in the U.S. And so there's ex an extraordinary way with, with that the container has both sort of prolonged the life of what we eat, but also enabled it to be transported at a cost that it actually makes sense to use the lower labor cost of China than it does to actually, um, you know, spend less money or do less carbon emissions to bring it just down the coast. And so carbon emissions aren't just about the sort of technical aspect, right? It's also political. Um, and so when, you know, the, the biggest difference I would say is that when the first container ship sailed, it, this is the Ideal X in 1956, it carried 18 containers on it. And today what you have, if you look at this chart, is that the largest container ship is 22,000 TEU. And these are called mega ships. They really sort of um, strive to get efficiency gains, which actually happens to be also more carbon efficient. But the difficulty, and this is what I want to suggest, is that mega ships also have these kinds of knock on effects um, on places like ports. Okay, I've got one minute, so I'm going to go really quickly. Um, so if you think about, so I want to just illustrate this a couple in a couple of places. So what the megaship does is it essentially brings in what used to be, let's say, 5,000 containers at a time to 22,000 containers at a time. 22,000 containers at a time, and this is the largest ship that currently exists, requires a 100-mile line of trucks, trucks to unload, um, which, and, and these ships are larger than the size of the Empire State Building on its side, right? So these are massive. And what they do is not just achieve carbon reductions on the sea, but they also then produce a whole set of uh, unfolding effects in the port. Ports now need to be dredged to be deeper. They also need to be, the trucks that sort of unload them also need to have more efficient spaces. And so what a lot of cities have ended up doing is produce um, efforts to, to sort of unload these trucks more efficiently. And that has caused, um, I want to argue, some really uneven effects on the poor and working classes. So I'm going to just illustrate this with a couple of examples. Um, the Alameda Corridor is a 20-mile long corridor that runs under LA. It's, um, it was commissioned as early as 1981, but completed in about 2005 and cost billions of dollars. Today it's in $4 billion of debt. Um, but what, what's funny about the Alameda Corridor is it's this technological solution, right? And yet it's only run at 40% capacity now because the costs of running it are too large. The costs that they charge per company are too large. Um, so what you have instead is highways that are still choked with single can trucks, the ones that you commonly see around um, New York. And that has con contributed, according to the California State Board of Health, to 3,700 premature deaths between 2002 and 2015, um, and what they, what they estimate to be actually 18,000 premature deaths that are more broadly related to carbon pollution started by the ports. Um, the Port of LA is actually uh, responsible for 59% of all carbon-related emissions in, um, in the city of LA. So if you think about these kinds of unfolding effects, it's really not just about what happens over the ocean, right? It's also about the intermodal design and how, how it elicits a whole set of other things along the way. Um, and then for just really quickly, another example jumping across the ocean is the Port of Singapore that has actually engaged in a lot of what's called land reclamation. So if you look here at the pink and red sites, the pink is what has currently been reclaimed and the red is what's aimed to be reclaimed. Singapore has increased its land mass by 30% um, since its founding in 1965. And what that's actually meant is that it's had to import sand to the tune of 520 million tons from different from countries around the area, including Indonesia and Malaysia. And what's, what's happened in the meantime is that, um, you know, researchers have, have shown that it's led to the disappearance of 24 Indonesian islands, um, to the depletion of marine and fishing life um, that has led to huge dips in the, um, the income of fishermen who depend on those sources in Malaysia and Indonesia. And so, you know, just to close up, I think what I want to suggest is that we really have to think about not just how we attend to the technocratic or technological dimensions of the shipping sector, but the ways in which shipping actually rises as a fundamental condition of what late capitalism requires of us, right, which is to generate and demand a consumption-fueled life um, in which, you know, buying our speaker and getting it delivered in two days is something that we expect. And, and, the, and what's sort of 
led to that and has been shipping um, in, in many ways. So I just want to end with a note, and I would love to sort of talk about community-based initiatives that do this work more, um, is that instead of thinking about climate mitigation, which is what the Paris Accords try to do, to think more about climate justice and what it would require for us to actually prioritize a working class environmentalism or an environmentalism of the poor, and to take really seriously that the lives that get most hit by these carbon emissions are not necessarily ours, right? They're gonna be the poor who live on the outskirts of cities who don't necessarily, um, aren't necessarily the first in line, especially when market-based initiatives prioritize market priorities and market profit. Um, so I'll end there and hopefully we can talk more about this stuff. Thanks.